The Christian right in the U.S. had also elaborated positions on adoption in the 80s and 90s that were concerned about making it easy, making it secret, and making it free from state influence. And they articulated these positions, you might remember it this way, that in opposition to bastard nation, a group styled after queer nation in both its name and its ability to drive the Christian right to distraction. <laughs> the fights over adoption in Guatemala were part of that new transnational activism by the Christian right over proper family forms that enabled children to be raised by someone other than their impoverished single mothers. All the same, adoption was keenly and perhaps even uniquely a Guatemalan issue as military kidnapping gave way to the massive expansion of transnational adoption. Using the same networks, the same lawyers and judges that had declared children orphans and placed them in international adoptions during the war, began a stunningly more lucrative practice after the war in placing children that may or may not have been voluntarily relinquished by their parents. <clears throat> Beginning in 1996, a number of evangelical churches and the two conservative political parties, the Partido de Avanza Nacional, the Party for National Advancement, or PAN, and the FRG, the Guatemalan Republic Republican Front, Rios Montt's party, and declared that what was, what was at that time the chief international instrument to regulate adoptions and ensure legal protections for birth families, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, was an agent of the destruction of the family. In 1998, after the signing of the peace accords and with the presence of a still larger reform-oriented legislative delegation drawn from the left, there was a serious effort to reform adoption and document abuse. That year, when enabling legislation for the Convention on the Rights of the Child was slated to go into effect, a number of opposition groups sprang up on, on the right, including the Association for the Homeland, the Association for Local Power, and the Anguished Mothers, <clears throat> the Madres Angustiadas, a middle class and Latina answer to leftist or indigenous led women's groups like GAM or Canavigua, the Mayan Widows Group. These anguished mothers were a group that sought an apolitical framework in which to understand the Latino sense of powerlessness in the context of the rising amounts of post-war street violence and kidnapping for ransom. The Madres Angustiadas argued that the convention would make it impossible for them to control their children, since it would give children freedom of religion, travel, expression, and a right to privacy over their space. It would destroy the family consistent spokesperson Jose Luis Gonzalez in the press. The Evangelical Alliance of Guatemala, a coalition of churches, also opposed the legislation. It's the responsibility of all Guatemalans, they said, to struggle against a law that undermines the family as the foundation of society and the church. Fernando Linares Beltranena, a conservative lawyer and col columnist for Prensa Libre, expanded on this position. The most surprising thing about the Children's Code is that it pretends to help children, but the majority of it with euphemisms and ambiguous terminology, with pretensions of legislating altruistically, and with foreign values, disintegrates family values, handing family authority over to the state, to a great bureaucratic network. He went on to insist that it prevented parents from taking any action if their children swore or wore miniskirts got tattoos, or cross-dressed. Only with an order from a judge, he insisted, this is my favorite, <laughs> could parents go into a children's room, child's room to look for drugs, guns, pornography, sex toys. The Nares also worked to construct a pan-Guatemalan account of these family values, arguing the not obvious position that this autonomous nuclear family that just wanted to be, be free was as Mayan as it was Latino. Quote, indigenous families who are trying to preserve their values and customs also will be especially affected by the code and the loss of their authority to halt this exercise of freedom, that is, to wear many skirts and use drugs, by their children. <coughs> Proponents of the convention took a different view, saying that the family's, uh, family values argument was a red herring. And the real issue was that it curtailed the abuse of power that resulted in fantastic money-making opportunities and adoptions. Quote, groups with economic power are involved in adoption, 
And when their interests are threatened, each time there's an effort to legislate in relation to adoption, the proposals get bogged down and don't do well, said Endeavor Cobar de Alvarado, the state's attorney for children and youth. The process, as it is, is very simple. Any notary can do it. And in this way, it's made into a simple matter of paperwork, in which the child is converted into a product, a good, rather than treated as a human being. In Congress, Nilith Montenegro argued that her Commission on Women, Minors, and the Family could document irregularities in 440 transnational adoptions, and that lawyers were making a fortune, 30,000 US dollars per adoption. The basic structure through which children came into transnational adoptions made it difficult to distinguish between legitimate adoptions, or at least those where the mother had consented. However much that consent may have been conditioned by the war's aftermath, community dissolution, refugee status, sexual abuse, poverty, violence, and other kinds of desperation, and those made possible through kidnapping threats or bribes. The adoption process rested legally on a notion of contracts in which consent could be freely given but in this instance to something that particularly indigenous people did not and had not reliably or freely controlled, especially where the war was intense, their children. Typically a midwife or haladora learned about, the, about newborns or young children that might be adopted and arranged for them to be sent to a foster mother employed by a lawyer who worked with adoption agencies, usually from the United States. The head of the section on minors and disappeared persons of the national police complained to the press that the law, law barely distinguished between legitimate and illegitimate adoptions. There was absolutely no way to bring charges against those involved in adoptions, even if the child had been kidnapped. Any lawyer, he said, can obtain the signature of a woman who says she's relinquishing a child for adoption. The only thing that can be prosecuted, he said, is if a lawyer rents out a house and hires people to care for children without obtaining a license to make it a nursery. The police also tried arresting Haladoras who were recruiting pregnant women to relinquish their babies, at times having them give birth at a private clinic set up for the purpose. Guatemala's orphanages were not a usual source of children for adoption. Children were usually too old by the time they might enter an orphanage. There were many more rounds of this fight in the legislature after the 1990s and a running guerrilla war over adoption in the Highlands, if that's the right phrase for it, as those alleged to be involved in international adoptions were intermittently lynched <coughs> by communities. And that's the word used in Guatemala, lynched. Lynchamiento. They were beaten by mobs and sometimes killed. Mostly, I hasten to add, Haladoras were also were seen as helpful. Women who arranged for children whose mothers were single or whose husbands were working overseas <coughs> to be raised far away where their social and material circumstances might be better. In some ways, the presence of overt trafficking, violence, and kidnapping of children obscures this much larger story about the economic and social conditions that made birth control inaccessible and single motherhood economically impossible or shameful. In 2008, for the second time in five years, opponents won, and transnational adoption was halted between Guatemala and the United States. Once again, ideological lines were sharply drawn. Fighting for reform and drawing attention to incidents involving kidnap kidnapping were the Fundacion Nirna Mac, a largely female human rights group that grew out of activism on behalf of civilians murdered by the army during the war, and Fundacion Sobrevivientes the explicitly feminist group I was talking about at the beginning that struggled to draw attention first to femicide and then to the disappearance of children. Leading the fight for transnational adoption was a lawyers group, the Defenders of Adoption, and U.S. parents of adopted children from Guatemala, which pressured the U.S. State Department not to enforce international human rights treaties with respect to adoption, specifically the Hague Convention. This time, though, the Christian right was far less explicitly involved in 2008. Although they provided many of the arguments that these more secular and even liberal adoption advocates used, one of these was that an earlier outspoken critic of human rights abuses in transnational adoption from Guatemala, Bruce Harris of Casa Alianza, was homosexual and hence self-evidently a child abuser. 